Well, hey there, everybody. Greetings and welcome to today's Grower Talks webinar. I'm Chris Bates, editor of, uh, well, you know, Grower Talks magazine, Green Profit magazine, and the e-newsletter Acres Online. And I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we discuss, well, you see the uh, the title right there on the slide, new research and new innovation in botrytis management. Now, why botrytis? Well, let me ask you this. Uh, is there a grower among us who has not cursed this scourge of the greenhouse at one time or another. I know I certainly did back in my greenhouse days. And it's a costly, uh, yeah, Jana's got her hand up there. No, I <laughs> didn't curse. I, I'm, it's joy. And it, has, and it has a reputation for developing resistance, which is not good, which is why all of us need to stay on top of the, the, uh, the control uh, and rotation methods and be knowledgeable about all the latest management options. And to, uh, to that end, we're hosting a webinar today, and I'm not the expert. I never am, but I've got two experts. You see them there right on your screen because we're using this new system where it's not just AM radio with pictures. It's like TV. Uh, <laughs> I've got two experts today, and they are uh, Dr. Jana Bickerman from Purdue University. There's Hello. Jana right there in the middle in the, in the pink. Let's change slides here. There we go. See, I don't need to show this anymore, but at least it has your name so people can understand what it is. And you're the professor and extension plant pathologist at Purdue. Is that yes, correct? Sir. That is correct. Beautiful. Let me get my headphones in there. Okay. Um, and you are broadcasting live from your palatial offices at Purdue today, Janet? I am indeed. So this is this is my den. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a beautiful spot. You said there's a lot of plants off to the, the right. Any of them have botrytis or other diseases? Are you like uh, um, uh, fermenting things? And <laughs> No, but I, I have a greenhouse full of fermenting things. <laughs> That's probably the wrong term there. I'll have to take a class. Uh, and then uh, being very patient down below is uh, Dr. Aaron Palmatier, formerly, but still kind of as a, as a, as a, as a uh, guest, uh, formerly of the University of Florida and now representing today's sponsor, Bear. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, thanks. Good to be here, Chris. And, uh, and while Jana has the high-priced, high-speed internet connection from Purdue, you are out in the sticks at your house in Homestead, Florida. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah yeah i'm in the sticks uh, so let's hope the, the internet connection cooperates uh, all right well we're uh, we're getting reports from the uh, from nina the work cast producer that everything's working fine in audience view so hopefully the audience is is doing just just fine as as well uh we hope we don't lose you down there in the uh, the bad if the wind blows who knows the internet connection may uh they blow away as well, but hopefully not. And you guys know me. I'm, uh, yeah, whatever. So, uh, so let's move on. Uh, if you're having any kind of a problem, um, you can use the live chat button. And Nina, our WorkCast technical support expert, will help you out. Uh, a big problem is uh, uh, you can't uh, you can't hear, and quite often it's because uh, you didn't turn your volume up. And for some reason, we just lost um, Jana. So let's see, is she still connected here? Uh, she just disconnected herself somehow. Jana, come on back in. That was one I was not counting on. You're, <laughs> she's supposed to have the good internet connection. Um, <laughs> there she is. Hey again, Jana. Sorry about that. No problem. We thought uh, Aaron had the bad connection, but no. I, I, no. no, this this was an ID10T error. Oh, okay. Don't do that again. Now, if you have questions, let's get moving here, kids. Use the, the there's, a, there's a, a question area on the right side of your screen. You can type them in. I will get to them. Uh, as as always, uh, as we uh, as we go along, if it's on the topic, uh, if uh, if uh, it's not on the topic, we'll get to it at the Q and A period at the end. Uh, now, this webinar will be archived. If you have to leave early, or if you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues or what have you, uh, go to the same place you signed up: GrowerTalks.com/webinars. And certainly, uh, one special thanks to our sponsor, Bear, who puts the free in, free webinar. Uh, I think that's my last slide, Jana, and you're now going to take over control. All right. See if I webinar. have the power. Yes. yes you've got it. All right. Take it, take it away. All right. So we're talking about gray mold. And as uh, Chris gave you the spoiler alert before, it doesn't matter what you do, how right you are, whatever crop you're growing, it seems like gray mold is going to find its way in there. It's... Uh, kind of like job security if you're a plant pathologist. And it's really funny because people generally um, don't like to hear over and over about the plant disease triangle, but it's a really important tool. And as a plant pathologist, I have to, you know, stand here 
and, and make sure I do this at least once per talk. So here you have your plant disease benediction um, and talk about the plant disease triangle. So when we talk about the plant disease triangle, it's a, a model and a way to understand how uh, disease actually happens. And to have disease, you need to have three things. Our pathogen, which in this case, we're mostly talking about botrytis, and we'll branch out to a few others. Um, a susceptible host, which in the case of botrytis, almost everything can be a susceptible host. There's varying degrees of resistance or tolerance, but uh, you know, if it's a green plant, it could probably be infected by some sort of botrytis. And then last but not least is the conducive environment. And that just means a, a, a situation that uh, drives disease. For botrytis in the greenhouse, I think of gray, cloudy, overcast days, maybe when there's just too much humidity as well. Uh, a dirty greenhouse would also end up actually uh, helping with a conducive environment. So first we're going to talk about resistance. And like I said, there's not a lot of really, really good resistance. But uh, one of the things that I've found is that um, plants that have more substance that are like a thicker form tend to resist uh, botrytis better than other plants. And here is an example. Um, I actually tried to do a botrytis trial with uh, one of the corallines of Vinca, and they're very robust. And uh, it was very, very hard to get um, disease. And later on, after the trial was over, I planted them outside. You know, we had seven inches of rain. My backyard was flooded and they still did not get botrytis. So these are a pretty, pretty resistant variety. Um, I guess another way of thinking about it is those strawberries you buy in the grocery store about that substance. You know, they're hard and crunchy for a reason. That's why they are resistant to botrytis. And that's what they've been bred for, in case you were wondering. So obviously resistance is hugely important and that's a way to actually break the disease triangle. Here's some other examples. This was a, a greenhouse I was just recently in um, where you can see the different begonias. And in this case, we're not talking just about uh, botrytis, but powdery mildew. And you can see how begonia escargot is obviously much more susceptible to powdery mildew than you can see many of these other varieties of begonia. So our next aspect about trying to deal with uh, the disease triangle is actually trying to manage the environment. And, and this comes down to cleanliness, which is actually a huge challenge. And that's why I figured we just, you know, the cleanliness is next to impossible. It doesn't mean we give up. We just have to recognize that there's only so much we can do uh, because of this pathogen. So when we're talking about sanitation in a greenhouse, you know, making sure you remove all of that plant material um, and it's discarded, hosing down the surface with water, but also sanitizing. There's a lot of various uh, sanitizing agents on the mar market, a diversity of quaternary ammonia compounds that are really good. Uh, Xerotol is another one I'm a big fan of because you could actually see where you've applied it. Um, sanitizing your tools and equipment. And of course, if you have that opportunity, uh, solarizing the greenhouse after the fact. Sanitation isn't just what you do in the greenhouse, but what you bring into the greenhouse. So here you could see uh, my friend Jim Chatfield from Ohio State. Um, this was actually in going into a nursery, trying to minimize the impact and introduction of Phytophthora. And here you could see the other extreme, which uh, maybe that dog from the previous slide left a present here in the corner. But this is obviously not a very clean greenhouse. There's uh, garbage on the floor. There's uh, dead heads on the floor, all sorts of things. So, so this is what you want to actually avoid. Right. Just to be clear, that foot bath is not leading into that greenhouse. No, that foot bath <laughs> is not leading into that it's, greenhouse. It's, it's, it's a little late for a foot bath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You might want it when you leave that greenhouse, though, <laughs> depending what you stepped in. So, so this is a video, and I'm just going to let this video play because of the wonderful technology that we're working with. I can't hear it play. I've heard it play before. This was done by Linda Wu Dumphy. And this actually explains the pathogen side of this uh, plant disease triangle. So if we could get that going, Chris. Just or click it one more time. Just click it one more time. Okay. Why is it? Oh, technical difficulties. Here we go. Gray mold is a disease that affects many crops around the world. Symptoms of gray mold can often be seen on strawberries after a few days in the fridge. Gray mold is caused by a fungus called botrytis. Botrytis reproduces through huge numbers of microscopic spores that form on minute tree-like structures. The spores are produced on leaves, flowers, and berries that have been attacked and killed by botrytis. 
When mature, the spores are easily dislodged and carried on air currents. The flowers of strawberry crops are commonly infected by spores that have been dispersed from nearby foliage. Once deposited on the flowers, the spores germinate and form fungal tubes or hyphae, which can invade flower parts such as stamens, pistils, sepals, and petals. As botrytis grows, it releases substances that cause the infected flower tissues to wither and die. Botrytis present in diseased stamens and pistils attacks the lower portions of the young fruit and may later destroy the entire berry. Nutrients absorbed from the fruits support the growth and spore production of botrytis. The visible gray mold on strawberries is actually the forest of fungal branches on which millions of spores are typically formed. This infection process can take many so isn't that so much better than just showing the life cycle slide? I, I think it is. I wish I would have had these when I was a student. So, so we're going to just go right into Botrytis. This is one of my favorite photos and reiterates what you just saw in the video. Here you could see all of those lovely spores that are just, you know, waiting and hanging out. And over here you could see a fallen petal, just one little petal. And, you know, how big of a problem could that be with respect to sanitation? Well, when you remove that petal, you can actually see what the problem is. And the spores land on that petal, and they actually use the petal as a food source to start actually working its way into the leaf. And this is why there really isn't a lot of good resistance to botrytis, because anytime a petal falls or anything, it allows the fungus to kind of build up its, its special powers and work its way into the plant. One of the other things we talked about was the number of spores. Here, once again, you see this lovely little cluster of grapes. This thing is just a beast when we grow it. It just literally millions upon millions of spores, which not only is important when you're trying to think of keeping your plants protected, you want to make sure you're always maintaining coverage. But it's also important when you think of resistance, because any one of these spores has an opportunity to end up evolving resistance. And so it's really important that we keep that population down so we can minimize that risk of resistance. All right, just to backtrack with the environment, overcast days, high relative humidity, all of these are troublesome, especially on believe it or not, our newer greenhouses more than our older greenhouses because they're tightly sealed and um, they're, they're more energy efficient. And with that energy efficiency, you end up having more warm air held inside. So how do you reduce humidity? Well, some of the obvious things would be proper watering, adequate plant spacing, which actually was the cause of what happened, uh, as you could see here. Well-drained floors so the water isn't uh, actually puddling around. Keeping the plants warm, but not too warm, and moving that air is hugely important. Uh, and venting. And venting is actually probably the least expensive way to keep your greenhouse dry, but it is actually uh, one of those things that it's kind of counterintuitive. Everybody wants to keep all of their hot air in their greenhouse in northern climates like where I'm at, and it's actually probably the most cost-effective method to manage botrytis. Because even when you do everything right, you properly space, you maintain your humidity, this is botrytis. It's like a freaking beast. And here you can see uh, it ended up getting botrytis anyway. You know, one of the things I also didn't mention that I've noticed is botrytis tends to also uh, affect those cuttings, even though these are seeds that were planted too deeply or stuck too deeply. So uh, keep all of those things in mind. All right, so when we're talking about ventilation, which I had just mentioned, this allows the moist greenhouse air to go outside with the drier air, at least here in the Midwest um, and all the way up through the Northeast. Winter is incredibly dry. I know all of you out in California, um, it's generally also dry all year round, um, but it's for the most part drier outside than inside. So exchanging that air actually ends up drying things out. Um, Heating uh, without venting uh, the moist air would just raise the temperature and raise the humidity. So you want to do this combination of heating and venting at the same time. Um, if you obviously vented without heating, your crops would chill. So this is why it seems counterintuitive, raise the heat and ventilate, but it, it actually works. And it makes financial sense too. 
Um, and in doing so, you end up with less botrytis, also keeping that air movement going. Um, it does mean you'll run the fans almost continuously, particularly here in the Midwest. We get a lot in February when it tends to be gray and overcast. Um, and the temperature tends to bounce all over the place, too. So then the next question is, what is a desirable humidity level? And that's going to change with the, pen the, the temperature. Um, everybody wants like this simple, straightforward answer that you want to keep it at, we'll just say 83% humidity, which is great, but you need then to make sure that your temperature is 50 degrees. And as it gets to be warmer, your relative humidity actually ends up um, increasing. So uh, these are things you want to actually keep in mind when you're trying to manage the diseases. Keep the humidity level down. Keep your plants spaced well. If possible, use plants that you have less of a problem with. Um, and, and going back to the Coravinca would be one example. Uh, some of the uh, New Guinea, not the New Guinea impatients, yeah, the New Guinea impatients also. Um, and then making sure that your humidity levels are correct. Now, Jana, were those, were those uh, maximum uh, humidity levels? Uh, yes. Or, or, op or op not optimum? But maximum. Not no, not optimum, maximum. So, so with that temperature, so, this is the highest you want because if you go higher than that, you'll start to get condensation, and that actually will uh, drive botrytis as opposed to preventing it. Okay. So how much does this actually cost? Well, you know, every so often I have to change this because you know gas prices change. But about right now, um, although this is oil at three three dollars per gallon of fuel oil. Um, it amounts to about 12 cents per cycle. Now, yes, you are cycling all the time, but that still ends up being less by way of labor and the cost of your fungicides than actually trying to spray and keep your botrytis controlled in a greenhouse environment, which is driving the disease. So it makes financial sense in addition to, uh, even though it does seem counterintuitive. So just talking about the cultural controls before we break into all of the really fun fungicide stuff. And the reason we did it this way is because you simply cannot control this d disease by fungicides alone. You will end up with resistance. We have a huge problem with resistance uh, with botrytis and a diversity of crops. And we have in the past in our greenhouse crops. So we really want to make sure when we deploy new chemistries that we protect them in the process. So making sure you're, you have a good clean greenhouse making sure the plants are spaced really well, reducing the humidity so you, by extension, reduce your leaf wetness. Uh, venting is a great way to do it. Um, and then last but not least, you can do everything right. You'll still need fungicides, but you won't have to rely on them as much. And they're just, they're kind of as uh, uh, an ounce of prevention instead of uh, trying to cure a problem that's already gone into uh, disaster mode. So what fungicides are there for botrytis? And please, at the end, you know, we can talk about rotations or potential things. The good news is, is there's a lot of fungicides and some of them are like old favorites, such as chlorothalonil. Some of them are, are believe it or not, polyoxin D. A lot of people think it's a new fungicide and um, it works very well on botrytis, but it actually came out before I was born. So that tells you how old that is. Um, dicarboxamid. There's another one, old fungicide. As long as you don't have resistance, it's great. Um, and then, of course, later on, we'll be talking about the 7-Elevens, which is probably, I would say, is most certainly our newest class of fungicides and how these actually work incredibly well to control botrytis and several other diseases uh, in a greenhouse or a nursery setting. So with that, I think I will be handing it over to Aaron. All right. I'm going to go ahead and, and take over. Uh, thank you, Jana. That was uh, I, I really enjoyed the, the introduction to Botrytis, and I'm sure the growers um, that are tuned in today appreciate um, everything that you covered. Um, and of course, the cultural uh, control options are, are really important, but but fungicides, um, especially in commercial production, where you've got uh, a high degree of plant uh, material that you're growing, uh, you know, for to, to be optimum conditions, healthy plants, uh, botrytis is, is just a, a, a tremendous uh, challenge. Um, so moving into fungicides, 
Um, this slide shows the succinate dehydrogenase inhibitor, the SDHI uh, groups of, of fungicides. And, and what I want to show here is, is this is essentially a toolbox of, uh, as you can see, the number of products that have come from this group seven. Um, I just, I'll point out, as, as uh, Jana mentioned, the 7-Elevens, you've got pageant, you've got orchestra, you have mural. Um, one thing about those three 7-Elevens is they are carboxamide SDHIs. Um, and one of the things about broad form, uh, the fungicide I want to introduce today, uh, this is a pyramide SDHI. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about those characteristics. Um, but one other thing to mention about this group of fungicides is that you have products like uh, a stun that are that that product in fact is just a botrytis only product and you've got flutalanil or ProStar that targets uh, specifically basidiomyces your rust rhizotonia sclerotium rothsii it's very it's very limited uh, in in what it controls and then, of course, we're, we're going to talk about broad form and, and broad uh, in the name broad, of course, implies that it, it covers a, a really wide spectrum of pathogens. Aaron, Aaron before we go on, um, refresh everybody's uh, memories or, or tell them for the first time. Maybe some don't know what is, what, why we call them 7-Elevens. What are the 7-Elevens, briefly? 7-Eleven, great, uh, great question, Chris. So the 7 part comes from the SDHI, the succinate dehydrogenase class that I was just talking about. And then the 11 part comes from the strobilurin chemistry. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the strobilurins and uh, particularly trifloxystrobin in a minute. Uh, but so it, it, it's those two groups of chemistry that represent 7-Eleven. Uh, and I think Jan will even, even elaborate a little bit more on that as well. Yep. Right. So those products have uh, a chemistry uh, or uh, active ingredients from both the seven category and the 11 category, right? Combined. That's, that's correct. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. Great, great combination of, of chemistry. Yeah. No, um, so, so the, the active that's new, uh, the part of broad form it, that's uh, new is fluopyram. And again, this is in that succinate dehydrogenase, um, a group of fungicides and essentially, uh, uh, what this active does is it, it has an impact on fungal or cellular respiration. So it reduces your adenosine triphosphate or essentially the energy production, the energy intensive processes in the fungus, uh, it inhibits those processes. And then, of course, with any fungicide, uh, it's, they're, they're always best used preventatively. Um, so just to give you a, a little glimpse on, on the side of inhibition, the, the fluopyram component of broad form targets the coenzyme Q. Okay, that's that complex two uh, part of respiration. And then the uh, trifloxystrobin component targets the cytochrome C. So the the nice thing about having that 711 combination is that you're you're getting a, a multi multi-site um, action or activity. Thus you're also you know reducing your 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 you're broadening the activity of the fungicide, but you're also reducing the uh, the, the potential for resistance. Um, trifloxystrobin is the other part. So, Chris, this is the, the 11 uh, part or, or the strobilurin chemistry. And uh, uh, tri trifloxystrobin has been around. Um, it's the active in the, um, the product Compass since about 1999. The, one of the main characteristics about this active is the translaminar activity or this mesostemic activity. And, and mesostemic was coined, it, it kind of, it, it represents the vapor phase of this active. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, but one thing that comes with good translaminar activity is, uh, is good residual. Uh, and you can see, you know, anywhere between 14, 26 days under 
uh, disease pressure um, you should expect from from uh, trifloxystrobin. And so I mentioned the vapor phase or the mesostemic activity. Uh, this product, uh, the one thing that's really nice about the trifloxystrobin component is that it will redistribute uh, and moves within and around the the entire leaf tissue. So rest assured, if you do a, a foliar spray, you're also going to get activity against pathogens that may be uh, infecting or colonizing the underside of the leaf. Um, but the other uh, component is the vapor phase. And, and so they learned about this vapor phase. Uh, one particular study was with wheat in a greenhouse where they observed disease control in plants that were adjacent to those that were treated with the fungicide. So essentially what's happening is that trifloxystrobin will, will move um, in and around the canopy and it offer, uh, again, a, a vapor type activity for, um, for control of, of especially leaf spot uh, pathogens and pathogens like Botrytis. Um, Aaron, is, is that unique to that active ingredient? I've never heard of that before. It, it is. It is. Yeah. Cool. That's a that's a unique characteristic of uh, trifloxystrobin. Um, so the fluopyram, I, I mentioned, you know, that the the group, the SDHI fungicides, and I mentioned that it is a pyramide. Um, it's the only uh, pyramide SDHI. Uh, that's available as a, as a fungicide. And one of the things, uh, of course, is due to, due to its chemical structure. So it does have a unique chemical structure. It's distinct from some of the carboxamide uh, SDHIs. The other thing that's been shown is, is the flexibility of the molecule. So there's been a lot of research um, looking at fluopyram and essentially what the, the they've determined that the flexibility is about a hundred times more flexible than other SDHI uh, chemistries. And what that does is it essentially minimizes, reduces the likelihood of resistance. So if the pathogen population builds a mutation, the flexibility in the molecule can actually adapt um, and, and uh, fill some of those binding sites. Uh, so that's one of the things uh, we see um, with fluopyram is, is that that reduced potential um, for for resistance. And and I just want to uh, present a study here. This was done uh, by some folks at Clemson University. Uh, I believe it was a, just over a dozen states where they collected uh, isolates of botrytis um, from strawberry. And I will mention that this says strawberry, uh, but Botrytis cinerea has uh, a really wide host range, o over 200 um, uh, plant species, um, and a lot of those are ornamental. So this is, in essence, this could be the same uh, pathogen that, that's attacking the ornamental crops. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the red arrows. And you can see that in fluopyram, for example, that area is the largest. That's the, that, that's the frequency of these isolates that are, we're still sensitive uh, to fluopyram. Uh, whereas you can see some of the others like Boscolid, for example, uh, you've got a very small percentage there, implying that that, that small percentage is what's actually uh, um, the, only, the only sensitive uh, portion of these populations. So there's a lot of resistance going on in, in Botrytis to, to, to Boscolid. There's some going on to uh, Fluxopyroxad. Uh, and in the pentheopyrad, that, that actually, that active is, is not available um, in ornamentals. Um, the other study, uh, just talking about resistance, this is one that was done in, in Florida. Uh, this is Dr. Natalia Perez, um, who had a graduate student that went to uh, nurseries and collected uh, strawberry nursery stock in about 14 different locations. And uh, she was able to gather about 409 uh, isolates of botrytis. The alarming thing, and, and Jana already spoke to this, but 
uh, Botrytis not only has the potential to build resistance uh, quickly, it also it, it's often that it can build resistance to multiple actives, multiple fungicides, and that and that's really scary. And that's why the fungicide resistance action committee has Botrytis listed in a high risk category. So the the majority of the isolates in this particular study were actually resistant to to more than uh, one active. Um, but just to, again, speak on behalf of, of fluopyram, you see that 0.2% that, uh, of those isolates actually showed any, any degree of, of, of resistance. So uh, still working strong uh, for botrytis control um, in strawberry uh, nurseries. Now, uh, this uh, presentation today is centered around botrytis. Um, but uh, it, it would not be good if I just uh, said that broad form only controls uh, botrytis. <laughs> it, it does have a very broad spectrum of activity. And uh, I've got a, a bunch of different pathogens listed on the slide. Um, just a couple comments. Um, scab, uh, cladosporium, if you look at the bottom the picture in the bottom uh, right side of the slide, that shows what, what scab uh, looks like on, um, on a succulent crop. And, and what, what I'm seeing is cladosporium has, has really become a, a much bigger player in, uh, for succulent growers, causing these, these scab-like lesions um, on the leaves of, of many different types of uh, cacti. And then space aloma is the, is the infamous uh, scab pathogen of poinsettia. And in Venturia is a scab uh, uh, pathogen that attacks a lot of uh, different types of fruit, fruit trees. And there are actually some woody ornamentals that Venturia uh, will attack. The other thing that I got really excited about with fluopyram is the activity on some of the endophytic dieback pathogens. So uh, if any of you have ever submitted a sample to the lab of a, of a branch dieback or a tip blight and received a report that says Botrosphyria, Diplodia, Fomopsis, um, these are all dieback, tip blight type pathogens that, that are often endophytic. They're in the plant and they, uh, at some point, they start to cause disease. Uh, but what we've learned, uh, fluopyram uh, does have activity on, on these groups of, of fungal pathogens. And so that's exciting. Uh, but I, I just want to, today I just want to share some, some activity um, uh, on Botrytis. Um, this, is a, this is a trial that Dr. Ann Chase did on geraniums. Um, essentially, all these treatments in her trial provided control of, of Botrytis, but you can see the plants treated with the four fluid ounce rate of broad form had the lowest disease um, in a trial. Was, in fact, it was statistically lower than those treated with mural. Um, this slide shows uh, rating dates uh, for Botrytis. Um, she actually looked at five different dates, and what you're seeing with the, the broad form treated plants is that one, only one out of the five actually uh, had sporulation, and sporulation is is really the big part of of the whole disease cycle because this pathogen produces uh, just hugely amount um, massive amounts of spores. And and I just want to mention that the last three rating dates you see zero sporulation there, so that speaks also to uh, residual control. And in the speed of control, um, this was Buzz Uber in California that. Uh, another geranium trial with botrytis. Uh, those dates up there, the 24 and the one week, uh, refer to 24 hours after the botrytis was introduced into the trial and then one week after it was introduced. And essentially, what I want to show is that, again, broad form treated plants had the lowest uh, amount of disease. But then the trend, if you see the, the disease not only was lowest, but then it, it, it went down. And in some of these cases, you see there's actually where, where the remain the same or in some cases even went up. Uh, so it's excellent activity um, uh, on, on Botrytis. And, and I just want to speak to the length of control. Uh, Buzz actually rated this trial or took it out 34 days after the last fungicide application. So uh, that just speaks to, to really solid uh, residual control for Botrytis. And again, uh, this shows the area under the disease progress curve. So this accounts for disease intensity or progression across the course of the entire duration of the trial 
um, with the broad form treated plants, uh, with the lowest, lowest amount of disease. Um, the other thing I, I want to uh, mention is that the, the fluopyram component of broad form is in fact systemic. Okay, so it will move in the xylem and it moves upward and outward, uh, but it also has, uh, of course, collectively with trifloxystrobin, uh, translaminar activity. And this just shows, again, the distribution. You can see the radiograph, the, the section in red where you can see the, the movement of the active uh, through the entire leaf uh, leaf area. And one other thing that's, that's really important to mention is that this systemicity will move um, through the stem and into bud tissue. The, this just shows an example of a stem application uh, where, again, the radiograph, any of the section in red there shows where the fungicide is moving through the plant. So you can see it's moving up into the younger tissue uh, with, with that growth, but uh, more importantly, it's moving uh, into uh, shoot and bud tissue as well. So that, that's kind of exciting, especially for a, a pathogen uh, like botrytis that, that is notorious for attacking uh, the flower buds. Um, I want to, uh, of course, show uh, a glamour shot of what the product looks like. Um, here's the bottle. Uh, it is actually comes in a, a 12 fluid ounce bottle. Um, one of the neat things uh, about the, the package is that, of course, it is recyclable. It is clear so growers or users can see the, the amount of active that remains in the bottle. Uh, but one cool thing is it does come with a measuring cap or cup, so, so it makes it convenient for, for measuring product um, out for application. And then the other thing, you can see that little yellow circle up there. That's a little uh, uh, foil cutter that they put on the top of the bottle. So you can essentially just invert the cap, turn it around, and, and cut that seal. Uh, again, it just uh, speaks for convenience. Um, broad form did, uh, it became available uh, for sale in September. And so it is out there. Uh, it is registered in all states except for uh, California, and uh, it's uh, not labeled for use in Puerto Rico at this time. I like the foil cutter. It's better than like shoving your finger through the top or your car keys or something. It, yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm not the only one who did so, that. Back some of us use our teeth, Chris. <laughs> you are. <hard> <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like pie petting with your mouth in the lab, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> some of us live dangerously. All right, and we've got some, we've got some questions coming in. I'm not going to tackle them yet because these they're kind of broad based. But just let yeah. the folks know who are typing them in. We will be getting to them. So. Okay, I, I just want to end with just a couple take-home uh, points so that we can let Jana continue on. And, and the bottom line with broad form and, and my excitement is, again, the resistance management tool, the fact that it is a, car, uh, a pyramide SDHI, so there's some unique uh, characteristics there. Um, it, it, it is really solid on botrytis, but also has a broad spectrum activity. And then um, I, you know, I just have to mention the simplicity in the bottle and the neat foil foil cutter on the on the cap. Right. <laughs> so Eric, with is, that, is, I'll, I'll, is one of the fifty downy mildew? That's something uh, Vern wants to know. That, that's a good question. So uh, it it will have some minimal impact on downy, I will say, and that's the trifloxystrobin component. Uh, I don't want to uh, to sell any uh, any wide claims uh, to, to anyone. It, it 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 you know it would it would definitely provide some level of control. Uh, in a broad spectrum, you know, rotation, but I don't consider this to be a primary downy mildew product. All right. And I believe uh, Dr. Beckerman's up. Oh, I think we double shot there. There we go. So one of the most fun thing about my job is that I get to see all of these fungicides before everybody else and I get to play with them and, and see what it is that they're capable of doing. And uh, actually, this one is from 2017. I think I was working with this in 2015 or 2016. Um, but here we have some, some data. And, you know, data is just it's such an interesting thing. And, you know, we live and die by it. But what you can see here is that um, actually that, you know, we have um, 
over here is the severity and over here are the number of infected leaves. So our untreated inoculated control actually, you know, we had probably close to 50% of the, the plant was infected. Um, it really took off. And not surprisingly, we had very good control with that old standby decree. But, you know, broad form at four ounces worked really, really well. In fact, it worked uh, just as well, statistically speaking, as did decree. So right here, you immediately see uh, two tools that you could use in rotation with each other to control, in this case, botrytis. Um, but what I want to show you, going to the next slide here, is the residue situation. And in this instance here, so my greenhouse, I have horrible water. It's really high in um, calcium and uh, alkalinity and all of those things. So usually we have a huge problem with residue. But here you could see even with the highest rates of broad form, we didn't have a residue issue and we didn't have phytotoxicity. Um, whereas with decree, hopefully you can see I have some other slides I'll show you in a bit. Um, there's definitely a residue issue. So that's one thing to keep in mind. We also in that trial had tried um, using several different formulations of biocontrols. And although this was a really high disease pressure trial, you could see here with the infection we were getting on the stems and things like that, that broad form at a low dose gave a good control. And actually the serenade actually didn't do too badly either. But again, with the old formulation of serenade opti, we did actually have a, a big residue problem. So, you know, keeping in mind this whole issue of residue and when you time things, and this is one of my favorite photos, which kind of shows you how crappy the water in my greenhouse is. Um, this is decree at the, the standard rate. I don't remember what it was. And uh, Chipco, which is uh, Ipridione, uh, old fungicide also labeled for botrytis, um, you could see we have huge problems with residue. Um, but, and I don't know, here you could see with the Serenade Opti, I don't know where the broad form photo went, but we didn't have this residue situation there. So. Oh, that's residue? I thought that was the powdery mildew itself. No, that's, that's the residue from the fungicide. <laughs> so um, Serenade Opti had it, ASO did not, and broad form has absolutely no residue. Um, so then the next question is how many applications? Because one of the biggest problems I see where growers um, fail to get the control they wanted is that they don't spray early and they don't spray often. So it's, it's like voting in Chicago. Do it early, do it often. Right, Chris? I live here. <laughs> <laughs> I won't talk about so, the politics here. <laughs> so here you could actually see that when you do a regular full season spray program um, versus an early season spray program, you get much better control, certainly compared to no spray. But as you start to slack off, you end up reducing um, the efficacy of control. And here is another trial that I did where this actually shows that um, – Broad form is capable of su suppressing sporulation. I hope you guys can see that because it's everybody's garbled here at my end. But what you can see is going 35 days out that broad form significantly uh, reduces the level of uh, sporulation. So this means, you know, with, you know, providing an application of broad form before you send things out to retail, one, you don't have the residue, and two, you're going to keep that sporulation down is a, a really good strategy. And maybe using those uh, high residue fungicides like Decree or Medallion or uh, Ipridione earlier, so that way you have something that, that you know, looks really attractive and uh, appeals to the consumer. So 35 days out, uh, Aaron was talking earlier about, you know, taking things out 30 some days, 35 days out, you could see broad form at eight ounces and even broad form at four ounces really, really reduced suppression. And this was statistically significant compared to uh, the other fungicides that we tested. Um, 42 days out, things started to equilibrate, but we're talking six weeks after the last application. So um, I think that's pretty remarkable for a fungicide. Hmm. Now that looks clear. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm having like weird technical difficulties here. 35 days out. So this is pretty much what I just said. I don't know what happened here. I apologize. 
here you could actually see the treatment comparison. Hopefully this is clearing up. And so here you could see our untreated inoculated control, which shouldn't have a lot of disease with botrytis. You always get a little bit, um, or the non-inoculated control, the inoculated control, of course we had it. Um, Orvego is not going to control botrytis. Um, it's sort of like the, the previous grower who had asked about using um, uh, how this works on downy mildew. It does work, but not particularly great. And of course, Ovego uh, is a great fungicide for Phytophthora and things like that, but it's not going to work on Botrytis. Here you can see the Compass provides great control and the broad form provided absolutely fantastic control at all levels of application without any residue or plant growth regulator effect. So making sure you're applying at the right time. Don't wait until the symptoms get to be out of control. Um, you always spraying to protect new growth. So if things are really growing lushly, that means you really need to increase your number of applications. The fungicide will last and it will last longer, but it's not going to, that vapor phase isn't going to protect it two weeks after application. You need to reapply and protect no, new growth. Fungicides never heal. They will protect and prevent, but they aren't going to cure those. We used to say that, and it's unfortunate because I think I'll spend the rest of my career trying to correct that misinterpretation. And last but not least, you don't have to dress up like a stormtrooper, but you do want to wear the appropriate protection. Uh, fungicides, compared to insecticides, fungicides are a lot less toxic, but um, yeah, you, you still want to make sure you protect yourself. So going back to timing, this is actually, I take my work home with me. This is my backyard. This was a cut flower section where I had a bunch of lilies from other trials that I stuck out there. And you can see I have just a few little spots of um, botrytis. You know, what, what's the big deal here? It's just a few spots. I'm just interested in the flowers and the stems. Well, I decided to keep an eye and see what happened. And this is, you know, I'm a terrible gardener. I'm a terrible horticulturist. That's why I, I call myself a plant pathologist to hide this. Um, here you can see the disease is starting to get worse. This is two weeks later, and we pretty much had pretty frequent rain. Two weeks after that, though, it just gets epic. So um, obviously, I do take my work home with me. I am a very talented plant pathologist. Um, this is what happens if you don't spray. If we would have started spraying earlier, when I showed you that first slide with a couple of spots, probably a little bit too late, believe it or not, if, especially if we're trying to manage resistance, but certainly better than waiting two weeks. And at this point, there's nothing you can do. So make sure you apply early and apply often. And here's one of our more recent trials. This is the one I was telling you about with this more resistant variety. And for those of you who are old like me, you remember what your 7-Elevens are. One of the questions I get over and over is, but which 7-Eleven is best? I would say the one that serves fresh coffee. But um, if we're talking about fungicides, what you want to see here is that really they all perform quite well. Uh, there are going to be differences that you will see. And uh, I think I have a, a little bit of that later on. But when, are you, when used appropriately and with the proper timing, you do get really good control. Uh, I will say the older fungicide pageant, which I was a big fan of and I'm still a fan of, um, it's not going to work as well. We are starting to see the beginning of resistance, uh, not just with the SDHI component, but also with the uh, strobilurin component. And that's going to be true of all of us in all of our greenhouses. So we need to be careful and make sure we do really good rotation so we can keep broad form and all these other chemistries uh, available for as long as possible. So in other words, don't overuse the 7-Elevens. Yeah, you, you really want to make so sure, well. right. They, and that's the, the biggest thing. And don't rotate between your 7-Elevens because those are just 7-Elevens. So you want to make sure that when you're, you're using Broadform, for example, that you don't rotate with Heritage, which is uh, a different company's product, but that's an 11 fungicide. Or you don't want to drench with Empress, which is also an 11 fungicide. Um, these are these would not be good rotations. So whenever possible, check out your frac codes. Uh, you can Google. Uh, I have a whole thing about fungicide rotations in the greenhouse and nursery, which I, I need to update, but uh, it'll at least get you started. Now, here's another trial that we did, and this was with powdery mildew. I think this was actually, I didn't put 2016, but it was two years ago. And you could see from this, we used this old product called Eagle. I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And here we have Compass, which is the, the bare... Trifloxystrobin, which is the 
QOI or 11 component of broad form. And for all of these, statistically speaking, we had very good control compared to our inoculated, untreated control. But when I show things like this, or whenever you see things like this, it's only part of the story. And this is why I want to uh, show you. So here's a picture where you can see this is our inoculated, our, our inoculum and our inoculated control, which was spreading through. And you could see all of these plants, for the most part, look good. You might be able to notice a couple of things that are a little bit off. But when I'm doing this, what I'm showing you is that statistics are really like bikinis. And what they show you is interesting and what they hide is essential, um, especially in this case. <laughs> I love this photo. Um, and I love that quote because, you know, I don't think people are lying when they're, they're using their statistics. I think the problem is, is that we're very familiar with people lying with words. That would be like a politician. And we're less familiar with people lying with numbers, which is what you can do with statistics. So I like to actually show you my numbers and show you photos so you could kind of intuitively understand what it is I'm trying to say. And so here's that same data displayed a different way. You can see my powdery mildew increased over time. And as you can see, with all but the a sublethal dose of broad form, you wouldn't want to use this, we got very good control. We got very good control with orchestra. Statistically speaking, we got very good control with mur mural. And of course, we got eagle. So the next question is, is, well, why don't I just use eagle? It's so much cheaper. And hopefully, and it didn't show up very well because it was in the summer in a greenhouse and uh, they're very leggy zinnias, but the eagle treated zinnia have much darker green leaves. Hopefully you can sort of see that here. And they also didn't flower as much. And that's not something you see when you go to the 7-Elevens. You don't get that plant growth regulator effect. And that is so important. Uh, when you're trying to sell these plants because nobody's buying their zinnia for nice green leaves. Last but not least, let's talk about Phytophthora here. This was a trial I did, uh, I believe it was in 2015. Um, and here you could see we used uh, Compass again, along with several different formulations of broad form. And here we used Orvego as well. Orvego is specifically for oomycetes and Phytophthora, and it performed very, very well. Same with Subdue Max. Um, but you can see that broad form performed quite well with Phytophthora. Um, Aaron might disagree, but I think if you were actually using, um, if you were trying to deal with, uh, let's say, something like Vinca and you want to control not only Phytophthora, but also Botrytis because you're not growing the Cora Phytophthora resistant uh, Vinca, that this would actually be a really good product. Um, even though you're, you're trying to protect against one thing, you're actually protecting against a lot of different things at the same time. And to me, that's the biggest value of a, a product like Broadform. Yeah, Jan, Jan I, agree, I agree with you. There, there's no question. I think that's the, the key is that broad, you know, that broad spectrum activity that does controls, you know, the OOMICs. Uh, it's just my, my only, um, recommendation is is that if you've got a an issue with phytophthora or downy you got to take out a bit you got to take out one of the big guns and, and go with a phytophthora downy specific product but but no question you're going to get you're going to get control um it's going to help you know Definitely yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think yeah. one of the big differences between Phytophthora and downy mildews is downy mildews are very prone to resistance. Whereas with the Phytophthoras, at least in the greenhouse, the resistance hasn't been the issue like it has been in other places. And, and even like in vegetable production and things like that, Phytophthoras seem less prone to resistance than downy mildews. Um, but as an yeah. all around protectant, um, Early in the process, early in uh, the greenhouse production or nursery production cycle, uh, broad form works really, really well, particularly for botrytis, the powdery mildews. Uh, I didn't show the data here, but I have some data on leaf spots with peonies, which would go back to, I think it's like three or four different species of botrytis, although Gary just Chastnagger said it was like up to 17 species of botrytis. The world is a crazy place. Did you guys even know there were 17 species of Botrytis? It's insane. We, we do um, now. Yes. We do yes. Now. I probably, so. Yeah, and I probably found like eight more while I was saying that. So we'll be up to like 26. Um, oh, wait. But the thing we're, to keep in mind is that it isn't a silver bullet, okay? These are great products, but you really want to be careful and you want to use them judiciously and you want to make sure you do your rotations well um, and that your cultural controls are in place so you aren't totally relying on them. So... 
with that, I think I turn it back over to Aaron. Well, I think we're going to hit some questions because awesome. we've got oh, at least a dozen down here. So I'm just going to put them out there and you guys can fight over who's going to answer it. So Laurie wants to know, uh, Claudio Sporium on succulents is broad form a uh, suppressant or a curative? Succulents, very interesting question. <laughs> That's a yeah, great question. That- that is a great question. So, yeah, the one thing is, of course, uh, I I can't uh, emphasize it enough to use fungicides in a preventative manner. Uh, disease is really best controlled preventatively. In terms of, of curative activity, you're gonna you're going to get the inhibition of sporulation. You're going to stop the disease progression. But any, of course, any tissue that's been damaged is is damaged. Uh, but but the way I look at curative activity, the fungicide is that if you can actually, in fact, save the plant. It's like if the plant is is declining, but you can arrest the development with a fungicide and, and possibly that plant may regrow out of that, you, you know, that condition that that's uh, that's the way I like to use curative. So I don't know if I. Yeah. And, and probably being answer. able to identify it, especially if you're growing a crop like succulents where you're not used to looking for disease issues like that, being able to identify it early and so treat it early before it, before it uh, gets away from you. One, one you of the big to. problems I've noticed with succulents is, you know, these are in many cases is being in the, the landscape or even where I live as house plants. And so they are expected to look good for a much longer period of time than say like the pansies or the snapdragons in your yard. Uh, so with that in mind, once the damage comes, just like Aaron said, there's not much you can do to fix it. It's there. What you're trying to do is protect the new growth, and then you could remove those damaged leaves later on. As far as how Broadform performs, I, I looked at cladosporium control on peonies. I know, not succulents, but at least it's a cladosporium, and it actually worked really well. Aaron still hasn't seen that data yet, but one of these days. <laughs> All right. Oh, how about uh, on uh, flowers, uh, open or tight, spraying blooms? I sprayed my peonies all the time and uh, all season long. And when they were blooming, it didn't seem to have any effect. No phytotoxicity. Uh, it was. It certainly was. Uh, considering the downpours we had, it, it definitely didn't hurt anything. All right. How about uh, veggie transplants? Labeled. Yeah, unfortunately, it it is not labeled for veggies at this time. All right. And someone asking about apples, same situation. It's Luna uh, sensation is used in the apple orchards. So that would be the equivalent product. So I've actually been using this for, I don't even know how many years, but that was first in the apple orchards where it performs really, really well uh, for control of scab, powdery mildew and rust. Just and what's the, the, what's the product name again, Jenna? That would be Luna sensation. Gotcha. Okay. And, uh, and Chris, uh, yeah. I will me- just mention it, it, that apples in a nursery stock situation, you 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 could still use, or you would use broad form. Broad form. It would be, yeah, just for nursery. But then once it leaves the nursery, it's uh, whether it goes to production, that's a different. You know, that would be the Luna sensation. Yeah, crab apples also would be the broad form. Uh, hawthorns, which get the same problems, broad form. Um, Puricantha, there's a whole bunch. They all got to love those rosaceous plants. <laughs> all right. Joe wants to know, and it's a pretty broad question, application rates and type of application, method of application. Okay, I can I can take this one. So that's a, a really good uh, question. I I had a slide. I don't know if I if I spaced out or if it didn't pop up the one that showed the label. Uh, but so the broad form, the product is uh, has a range from two to eight fluid ounces. Uh, but what we've determined from the efficacy studies, uh, we're recommending a four fluid ounce. So uh, keep it simple: four fluid ounces uh, per hundred gallons uh, across the board. Um, in terms of application interval, uh, you, if you have onset of disease, uh, you're looking at about uh, 14 days. Uh, most of our trials, uh, we're looking at 14-day spray intervals. Okay. Uh, Kevin wants to know, are there any bio 
um, pesticides you'd suggest for botrytis control? In the trial I showed, Serenade is actually a Bacillus subtilis, so that would be a product that could be used. One thing to keep in mind is that it does require more frequent applications, uh, but it, it is effective under low to moderate disease pressure with you know, applications, I would say, about every three to five days instead of once every 14. And I'm sure there are others, but that's just off the top of my head. All right. Katie wants to know, um, for those of us who have been using pageant, which contains the same frac groups as Broadform, how do you suggest integrating uh, it into a program uh, without encouraging resistance? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so without encouraging resistance. So the one thing is you don't want to rotate – uh, the 7-Elevens back to back, of course, uh, with, with, uh, like, like broad form, uh, you wouldn't want to do more than two sequential applications before rotating to a different class of, of chemistry. So you can, you, you don't have to just, uh, rotate every application. You can do two sequential and sometimes that one, two, uh, punches is, is, is really effective in ter in terms of, of using, uh, using pageant of course, you know, of course you just wouldn't want to rotate the two sequentially. I mean, you'd want to mix something, uh, in between those applications from a, from a different, uh, different class of fungicide. How many uh, different, um, uh, AIs or frat groups should you be selecting from at minimum to, uh, to hopefully prevent resistance? That's an excellent question, and I don't know of anybody who's actually done any research to, to look at that directly. Uh, the more fungicides you rotate through, the better chance, if anything, is evolving resistance that you can kill it with something different. More um, is better, sure. So, so more is, of course, it, it, it provides more opportunity as well. Um, that said, it gets to be economically unfeasible as well. So I would say, going back to Katie's question, to choose, you know, find a 7-Eleven that you're, you're happy with and, and choose that one. Pageant, when it first came out, was a great 7-Eleven. There are new 7-Elevens now. Uh, Broadform is one. Uh, Mural and orchestra are others. Uh, you, you just have to choose, you know, and, and the choice there has a lot to do with the economics. Um, and then make sure you rotate. If you're controlling botrytis, make sure you throw in a, a decree or a medallion, um, I think is hugely important. Um, you know, when thiophanate methyl first came out, everybody used it and now we have resistance. And But that's going to be on a greenhouse by greenhouse basis. Um, I think going through and using an occasional application of chlorothalonil, which, you know, we won't have resistance to because it's a multi-site and it's an old chemistry, um, is a really good way of knocking things down, too. So uh, so I think there I named one, two, three, four or five different um, modes of action to, to help mitigate resistance. All right. And that the question came from Matt. So he gets the credit for the really good question. Thank you, Matt. Uh, is it available in Canada? Asks Rachel and Luke. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I do not believe it's available in Canada at this time. I can look into that, though. Um, yeah, I, I, they, if, if I'd be happy to uh, follow up with them and, and talk to my colleagues in Canada, but I I'm, don't believe it's available at this time. All right. Uh, do you recommend an adjuvant or sticker to increase uh, efficacy? Yeah, that's a great, great question. It's, it's not necessary. Uh, but, uh, there's definitely advantages. Um, so it's, if you're, especially if you're comfortable, you, you know, have a, a history of working, working with one particular, uh, adjuvant, you, you feel comfortable and you can make informed decisions with, and, uh, we have not seen any issues from a compatibility standpoint. Uh, we haven't found one yet that's, that's incompatible, I should say. Okay. I, I would agree with that. Um, if it's something that you're working with, you know, something like a capsule or a silhouette will, you know, reduce what little residue you have even more and it does spread it out. Um, I don't know if it really improves performance that much. I, I don't think, 
I know of any data to support that, but um, I just be careful with what you're, you're mixing and make sure that uh, I would always test in a small section just to make sure there's no phytotoxicity because uh, generally I get called in when things go south and uh, a lot of that could be avoided if people were just to test a little section before they spray everything. So, yeah, all right. Speaking of testing, have anybody tested it on Boston Fern that you know of? Uh, Diane wants to know. Uh, it, it has, in fact, uh, been sprayed on Boston Ferns. I uh, haven't seen any, any issues. Um, yep, there's a trial in South Florida looking at aerial blight, rhizoctonia um, on Boston Ferns. All right. And we had a question earlier about uh, rates and application methods. And I don't recall if you touched on application methods in that. Uh, Tim wants to know if you can apply it through a cold fogger. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, that's one that um, we are working on. Uh, I, my understanding is that you know, we, we do have a, one particular grower who's, who's done a demo trial with a coal fogger and we haven't had any issues. Uh, you know, in terms of, of getting that, lab, that language on the label, that's something we have to go after. All right. And we mentioned Canada before. How about California? I assume Bear is working on it diligently as we speak. Bear is working on it diligently. Unfortunately, California is the only uh, state uh, where it's not currently labeled for use. Well, they, they eventually come around. All right. We've got a few yeah. more questions, but we've really got to wrap up now. We're, we're five minutes over our time. These two could talk. What was it that term you stereo chemistry, Jana? Oh yeah, I were... just I love Darren's <laughs> pictures of the stereo chemistry. Of... These guys, these two could go for hours on this topic and get really down in the weeds, and it's not even a weed seminar. That's the funniest thing. Uh, but we've got to move on. So if you didn't get your question answered, we apologize. But you know what? These guys will answer it one on one, and here's their email addresses. Uh, jot them down real quick, and you can you can go back into the uh, the archive. Because as I promised, it takes a little while for me to get it up, but not too long. The webinar will be archived at the same place where you uh, where you sign up for it. And um, I do want to thank my uh, my sponsor, Bear, one more time for loaning us. Uh, Aaron, what we got to do is get Bear to get you a better internet connection down there, buddy. But uh, that's another topic. Uh, but Bear puts the free <laughs> in free webinar. So that said, uh, I want to thank uh, both you guys for giving a great presentation. They're veterans of my webinars and yet they keep coming back. So let's do, let's do it again. Um, and I especially want to uh, thank everybody at Purdue and at Bear and all my staff at Ball Publishing who work hard to not burn the place down when I'm <laughs> gone. Uh, this is Chris Beatty saying, until next time, so long, everybody. Oh, the band is in a rare form today. <laughs>